This is Felipe. He's a, he's a farmer uh, and a roaster and an exporter in, uh, from Brazil. Uh, he's, been, uh, he's a fifth generation and uh, is working with his family. Um, I visited him in Brazil uh, at the coffee shop. You still have it? Yes, so he's still two. Whoa. Two coffee shops, uh, very nice and uh, interesting uh, in a beautiful location. So he's going to uh, talk to us uh, a little bit about exploring fermentation. So he's been working with fermentation for a couple of years. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to. Maybe you can finish the introduction for yourself. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, it's a huge honor to be here. Can everybody hear me in the back? We're good. Cool. Um, it's, it's really cool to be here with you guys. Um, it's very humbling to see a room full of professionals working together to improve their craft. Um, I th keep imagining I was talking to Hannah about if we were one day able to have like a producer's virgin version of this, how cool that would be. Um, and I think that um, this is what it takes to, to get better and to create uh, credibility in the eyes of the market uh, is us to keep pushing the envelope on quality. Um, so I uh, decided to talk today a little bit with uh, Philip about, asked me to talk about processing, fermentation. Um, we talked a little bit about doing some kind of interactive thing um, with you guys giving ideas. But in the end, I just put together uh, some coffees based on empirical tests that I've done on the farm for us to cup. So I'll talk to you a little bit about what we're doing, and then we'll cup, and then we'll have you guys give your opinions. Um, so a lot of people, I'm sure all of you have heard the idea that the metaphor that coffee is like wine. And I would argue that it's not uh, today. Because the first thing is, it's, it's two reasons. The first thing is uh, people are not willing to pay as much for coffee as they are for wine. And the second reason is that in wine, um, you get the best wines at the origin of the, of the vineyard, of the wine. Um, if we were to go into town and go to a specialty wine shop and we could pay a lot of money and get a great wine from, say, France, but if we were to go to France and to that region, we would find things that we would only find there, um, arguably, and have an experience that is enriching. And I hope that one day, if coffee were to actually be like wine, that you would drink uh, the best coffee at the farms and get the, the most amount of uh, knowledge from them because they're roasting one coffee all the time, their own coffee. They should be experts about it. You guys are roasting a different coffee every single day. Um, so when it comes to farming uh, coffee, um, today we basically have people putting cherries on a tree and then just keeping them from going bad. And I think that we need to change that. And one of those things is in uh, processing and flavor uh, development and, and having them be a part of that. So when I got into coffee, although I'm a, technically I'm a fifth generation farmer, um, I got into coffee while I was in the US. Uh, we lived there for a while and I got a job at a specialty coffee roastery in 2007. Um, and I heard this story several times. I, I haven't heard it in a while, but back in 2007, everyone said, um, Coffee's 100 points on the tree, and we just try not to mess it up. I don't know how many of you have heard that before, um, but that could not be farther from the truth. Um, there are so many things involved with the quality of the bean, and so many things that could go, go wrong with terroir, with, uh, with diseases, and all, all kinds of that. So. Um, what we should be thinking about is creating farmers into crafters of the beverage so that they're thinking about these things. Um, so when we're talking about, when I came back to the farm from being in a roaster's mindset, cupper's mindset, I came back and I said, man, I want to have a delicious espresso. Um, 
what variety should I plant? You know, so it's kind of a different way of thinking that um, I had a bit of a shock at first with the farmers in my region. Um, I learned that none of them actually tasted their coffee in a suitable roast or brew or any of that. Um, but uh, so these, all these things, they really affect your, your flavor in a huge, huge way. Um, which showing that if the farmer is involved in participating in this, the outcome could be so much better. So I'm going to focus today on processing, and that's the that's what we're cupping. But I'm just going to go really quick on the first the first three over there, and just give you examples of how we could adjust these to a better outcome. So um, a couple examples of my region of my farms. Um, I'm in uh, Mogiana region of São Paulo, of Brazil. It's uh, southeast of South America. For those of you that don't know, it's border of São Paulo and Minas Gerais. Um, the cup flavor of our micro region of our terroir. It's a fatty, creamy body, um, mild to medium high acidity, dried fruits, berries, citric. Um, that's kind of the the general uh, taste of the of the terroir itself. Um, Coffee is grown from 700 to 1,000, almost 1,450 meters, 1,500 meters. Um, so, one of the things about our terroir is that uh, we have four seasons, and we have also a distinct wet season and a dry season, and this dry season lasts for about four to five months, and it starts anywhere from May to mid-June. Now, the thing is, the early ripening varietals and the lower, the lower uh, plants, they start harvest m in May. Um, every single year since I've been in farming, and this has been since 2008 that I've been on the farm, Every single year, it's rained for 10 to 15 days in May or June. Um, and then a lot of farmers, I hear them say every single year, though the coffee was great, perfect to pick, and that it all fell on the ground. So when it rains, they can't, they can't go pick, and it gets knocked off the tree. Um, the other thing is it's humid and hot in May, um, which is a uh, recipe for um, one, the varietal will jump the phase. It will go through cherry really fast, and the processing um, will be more delicate. So um, another, a thing that, that I put up here as farm management that a farmer could do is play with that date of picking. So this is, again, this is very like local, my area, what works in my area. So um, I run two farms. I have a farm at 1,000 meters, around 1,000 meters, and a farm at 1,400 meters. The, th the farm at 1,400 meters, I start picking around July 15th. No problems with rain at all. The farm at 1,000 meters, sometimes it starts, we start usually picking in May. So uh, by picking a varietal that is later harvesting, um, and by conducting, say, shade, and there's things you can put in, into the soil that's also allowed in organics or um, that you can slow down the maturation of the tree. So uh, one example is a variety called obata, which is a Brazilian varietal. It's a slow ripening tree. Um, it's about a month after uh, catuai and a month and a half after bourbon, which is a fast ripening tree. Um, if you add shade, you can slow this down as well. So I start picking in uh, around June 20th. So that's when the, the cold month comes in and the cherries, they kind of stick in this cold cherry phase. Uh, and I have a longer time to pick cherries. So um, there's just a couple examples of, coffee's not 100 points on the tree. It's, there's, there's a lot more to that. So um, when I was at this roastery in the US and I was coming back to the farm, um, my former boss told me, it's really easy. You just need to tell everyone to pick ripe. So that's what I did. Um, it's that easy. Um, 
No, but uh, over the years, we started um, paying attention to uh, how we were drying. And I think the way that you guys talk about drying coffee, or roasting coffee, is just like huge ideas to how we could dry coffees as well. And so it would be really cool if we, as farmers, started talking about drying profiles um, and maybe dividing up the drying into three phases. So that's the way I've been thinking about processing coffee. In the first part, I deem the fermentation stage. And then I call the middle dry and the final dry. So I'm going to focus on the first part. I'll, in the end, I'll talk really quick about the other ones. Um, but I'm going to talk to you about the middle dry as the cuff, as the, the fermentation, as the cupping we're going to do. Um, the variables, the two and three, they're the same. What changes is number one. Um, according to a couple of professors in Brazil, um, Leandro Paiva and Flavio Boreng from universities in Brazil, uh, they've suggested that specialty coffee should be dried at a minimum of 15 days. Um, it, it can be different in different parts of the world, uh, but that's what they, they did test that was the best to preserve the cell structure of the bean. Um, obviously, it could be more or less, but this was sort of a number that they suggested. So, um, did I miss a step? Okay. Um, coffee comes from the fields. It's picked. For those of you that are not aware of processing, uh, you could, there's many ways to sort, but I won't go into that. Then you could either leave the skin on the, on the cherry and we, we call that a natural. We could take the skin off, and we could take the mucilage off from a demucilager or any kind of reason, and we dry that. So there's no fermentation there. That's called a semi-wash or pulped natural. Um, you could leave mucilage in varying amounts, and you could also call that a pulp natural, but perhaps uh, makes more sense to call it a honey. Um, if you were to take those cherries that, that you took off the, the skin, you could also do this with naturals, but if you take those cherries and you put them in a tank and you dry it, ferment them without water, we call that a dry fermentation or aerobic fermentation. If you put that into a tank with water, we call that anaerobic, or if you were to expel oxygen by any with gas or any, any way, we would call that anaerobic. Um, and these have different effects on, on the result of acidity, um, texture. Um, one example that we've noticed is, for example, the picture on the top left, or is it, yeah, left, is a dry fermentation. Um, we have more acetic acid developed um, lower body compared to the one on the right, which is a washed, which is with water. Um, with the lack of oxygen, it's like our bodies, we, it develops lactic acid. Um, so you tend to get a bigger body out of those coffees. This would be a natural. And then over there, you see drying uh, washed honey and a natural. So. Uh, what exactly is fermentation? It's the breakdown of uh, substances by bacteria, yeast, microorganisms. Um, this is um, often the breakdown of the sugar uh, that's on the bean. And um, it's important for us to note that for farmers up until today, even today, Fermentation is something to be avoided. Like the communication to them is that that's the reason why they got paid less money. That's the reason why they got disqualified from a competition. So they have no idea, most farmers have no idea what fermentation is except that it's something that means your coffee is bad. So um, roasters, from my experience, have been looking for coffees that don't have defects coffees that are consistent and replicable throughout the year, and maybe more years. Um, and consumers, I would argue, have no idea that fermentation in coffee is a thing. 
So um, there are some places around the world that, that farmers have been doing some sort of fermentation more, which is maybe Central America, uh, parts of Africa. And in these places, um, I would say that fermentation has been primarily to take the mucilage off of the bean before drying. And aroma, flavor characteristic, that sort of comes second. Um, but in many different uh, industries, fermentation has already been well established, it's been well studied, well controlled, and it's been proven to add benefits. Uh, consumers have an idea that this is a thing and it's true. Um, so for example, beer, uh, the fermentation adds aroma characteristics. In cheese, it adds flavor and it keeps the cheese from being contaminated. Uh, and in wine, which is perhaps the most studied, um, consistency, um, aroma, flavor, and just the stabilizing of the, of the product itself. So the interesting thing is in wine, we can drink a wine in the airplane and you know, it's, it's a it's stable product, but we cannot drink coffee in an airplane and in many other places. So um, that's something to be said. Okay, there are many different kinds of yeasts and bacteria. Um, and every, what I say here is uh, we're just in the beginning of studying this, at least I am. And uh, what I've done is mostly empirical. Uh, I started working with um, a scientist by the name of Lo Laurent Berthiaud from Lallemont. It's a yeast uh, company and enzymes and out of Toulouse, France, uh, and give me some kind of scientific theoretical background. Uh, but this was the first harvest, and uh, in the past, um, I've studied uh, just kind of by myself, and I realized that the best yeast that was working well was Saccharomyces and uh, fruit yeasts. Um, and then Lahan said, yeah, well, you know, coffee is a fruit. It makes sense. But uh, it took me a while to do some pretty bad tests with Hefeweizen and ale and other things to figure that out. But um, some of the beer yeasts are grain yeasts. So we've been sticking to fruit yeast as coffee is a fruit. Um, there are other kinds of yeasts as well, like lactobacillus. They can be uh, used in when you make yogurt from milk. Uh, it coagulates the milk and it gives the texture of the yogurt that could be studied. Um, so basically, it's just a matter of lots and lots of tests, just like anything, except with the roasting, you do a test and then you do another one and another one. And with us, it's like, okay, now I wait one more year. You know, so it's a little bit slower on the farms. Um, and um, this is some of the things that uh, can be done to help uh, measuring bricks, measuring uh, having a yeast from like a reputable source and um, measuring everything out and writing everything down. So uh, there's a lot of study in the flavor components of yeast, aroma and flavor uh, that are proven in other substances. And most often than not, some of it carries on to coffee. So if uh, you ask a wine specialist, uh, the Zemoflor X5 yeast is super, super fruity. Well, probably it will be very fruity in coffee as well. So that's a good place to start, although I think we need to map out the different strains, what they taste like when they're used in coffee as well. Um, and another note, uh, in parentheses here, is I work in, in Brazil, I work with um, small and medium family farms. Um, most of you don't know this, but there's 330,000 farms in Brazil, and 280,000 of them are small uh, farms. So a small farm in Brazil is seven to 10 hectares. And um, that means that the infrastructure is not always, the, the best uh, high-tech things to work with. So it's about, a lot of the times, at least for me, it's about understanding what's going on and trying to adapt that to the infrastructure, to the way the farm works, uh, to the workflow, to, to have that um, 
to have that work. So uh, a lot of it is like uh, done in water, what, what do you call it, water tanks. Uh, this is a 500 liter tank. And so, Well, it's just a video to show, like, uh, you can hear the yeast, you can hear it, like, alive, um, which is kind of cool. Uh, and um, that's in a, in a controlled tank. So um, what happens when you do uh, fermentation in a tank is once you stop it, that fermentation is done. Um, if you do a honey or a natural on the patio, um, it could go on for up to a week. Um, so there's several different ways that you can go about doing that. Um, the things that, that uh, we've noted so far that fermentation is interesting is, um, well, it changes the aesthetic of the bean. Um, it goes to a darker color, maybe a darker blue, especially in washed. The density of the bean goes up. Um, and it becomes more homogeneous uh, bean. So that's going to change the way you roast as well. Um, according to uh, Laurent and the studies that he's done, that, and he so far is a believer of only using the mucilage that's in the, in the coffee bean itself. So the test that we've done so far is it has a graph that the fermentation can improve flavor up until a point, and then it gets worse. And this could be anywhere from 14 hours to 48 hours, depending on the temperature, depending on the amount of water. Um, and he says that, uh, he's a believer that the, the yeast, they enhance the flavor that's in the varietal. And the test that we've done, I, 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 I see what, what he says, and it basically makes the coffee cleaner, makes it a little crisper, makes it easier to pick out uh, the, the flavor notes that perhaps we want. Um, I've done some tests where I actually push the fermentation more. Um, so I kind of guessed that the, maybe it was the, the sugar level was gone, that the yeast was eating, and then uh, that's when the weird things start happening. So I added sugar, um, and I played with uh, temperature. So I pushed it. Uh, for longer longer times of fermentation um, and also got a lot of activity going on. Uh, and so I would even say that once you do that, you create flavors. So you add flavors that weren't, wasn't in the coffee before. Um, and that's where I think uh, needs to be done more study into, you start to get the flavor of the yeast. So there are yeasts that are fruity, there are yeasts that are pineapple, there are yeasts that are not fruity, but they have other uh, characteristics to them. Um, and so uh, there's still so much to be looked into that. That's okay. Okay, so um, the other thing that we found is that um, the, the coffees that were fermented, they had an increased shelf life. Um, now, for the purposes of today, I only put eight coffees on the table, so I don't have any from last crop. But um, my coffees, they generally have lasted about uh, 10 months, um, according to my roasters and to the ro coffees that I've roasted, depending on how you store them, of course. But um, my yeast fermentation lasted up until uh, about a month ago. Um, so, uh, they've basically they've had not shown past crop up until August, whereas my other coffees showed past crop around June. Um, so that's something that uh, the, those are three things that basically we could look into is uh, consistency of the coffee um, and consistency of the fermentation. Uh, which if you're a roaster or a barista and you want to dial in a coffee, dial in a shot, and you have that coffee tasting the same, even though it's very fruity, um, you have the fruit always be the same. That could be something interesting. The second thing is um, the, 
uh, enhancement of the flavor that's in the coffee or maybe even adding another flavor that wasn't there before. And then the third thing is if that coffee can last longer, um, does that bring more value to, to the roaster? Okay. Um, so now I'm going to go real quick ab about the rest of the, how the rest of the drying was done. And then we'll go into the cupping and I'll explain what coffees are in the cupping. Um, so basically once you ferment and uh, if you do this in a tank, uh, once you wash the coffee, that fermentation is done. And then you're into the middle dry. If you do it um, like natural straight on the bed, uh, depending, it depends a lot on the, the humidity level of uh, your, your terrace, the one you're picking. Um, so what I've found is that um, the ideal sort of drying for naturals is between 50 and 60 percent humidity. Uh, there's a couple of naturals there that were dried on different uh, moisture, moisture levels. And so if you ask a farmer, how long did you dry your coffee? And they'll always say, well, it depends if it was June or if it was July or if it was August. So for us, in our region, it starts at like 70% humidity. And then in August, it'll be like 30, 25, 30% humidity. Um, and so uh, the flavors that I've liked uh, have come around 50% humidity, 50 to 60% humidity. So the, the middle dry, though, is, as far as I've understood it, the least influencing on the flavor. Um, that's when the fermentation is done, and that's when you're, you're bringing the coffee down. I do it to about 18% humidity, um, and I can dry this fairly... Uh, Fairly quick, it's not going to affect the, the, the coffee is pretty stable still, it's a pretty alive. And then the last part of the drying is, it's kind of like a roasting profile. That's where I found that it's, it's the most sensitive. So um, the last part of the drying at 18%, we put it under shade. We do what we call a volcano. So we get it very uniform um, into the end of the drying. Okay, uh, this is just a couple examples of uh, good drying and bad drying. Um, and the final dry, uh, the picture on the left, um, it gets really hot in there and the sides are totally closed. So that's basically like an oven. And I tell, coffee is like actually very similar to humans in terms of the conditions that it likes to grow in, the conditions that it likes to dry in. And so it's something simple that I tell farmers is, if it's too hot for you inside there, it's too hot for the coffee. Um, so uh, that can get up to 40, 50 degrees C inside the left. Um, whereas the right, if you can see, there's a shade net installed on the top of that, and so it won't go higher than 30, 30 C, um, which is crucial, especially uh, a lot of farmers, once they, before they export, they will bring the coffee back to dry if it's gone up above 11%, they'll dry it back, and that's when a lot of the, the quality is lost. Um, here's another video, we'll go without volume, but um, if you can see, this is the same coffee um, but they're two different colors, they're roasting very differently. This one is darker, um, as this one is much lighter. Um, they're both started, the roasted in the same profile started at the same time. Um, one is a, nat a regular natural, and one is a natural that was fermented in a tank with water, with yeast, uh, for 48 hours. So they're both on the table, but if you could see, um, the roasting is totally different. So. Once we start changing uh, uh, profiles, that might change your roasting profile as well. So today we talk mostly about naturals, pulp naturals, and washed. And I assume that you guys uh, roast them, approach them differently. Um, once we start, if, if the coffee industry starts to play with fermentation and play with the density of the beans, um, you might have to see adjustments in your roast profiles as well. So, all right, I can see some people getting sleepy, so we'll go into cupping. <laughs> um, I prepared for you guys eight coffees, um, basically one through four. You want to ask a question? Yeah, one question. Uh, if you do the wash coffee, uh, you can have the demonstration machines. 
Is there really a temptation that's still going on? Because I thought all the mucilage is taken off. If you take the skin off and then demucilage it, then there's no fermentation. Nah, maybe something on the tree, but if you took all the skin, the the sugar off, then you go straight into drying. Yeah. You talk about controlled fermentation, but you all said it's alive. How how much can you really control it, and how do you control it, or and how? Um, yeah, I think that you can control the um, the temperature, uh, the amount of sugar, the yeast. So either you're using wild yeast, which is, uh, you know, spontaneous, or you're using a yeast that was from a laboratory, and it should do what its DNA says. Um, now, doing it in those tanks, it's pretty hard to control. Um, but if, if you were to have, like, stainless steel tanks and stuff like that, kind of like the wine industry, then you could control uh, the hygiene, you could control the amount of oxygen, all kinds of things. And so, um, you know, the purpose of what I wanted to show you guys was that, like, once you cup this, if you guys could answer me, does fermentation influence flavor at all? Like, is this something that we should look into? Like, is, does it change flavor enough? Um, and again, this is empirical, um, and it's far from, I think, the, the final result. There, there are some mistakes I made. Um, but uh, we have eight coffees. Seven of them are the same varietal, um, Katwai, red Katwai. One of them is a yellow Bourbon. Um, the rest of the drying was done pretty much the same. The first four coffees are the same exact coffee picked on the same day, um, and then just changing the, the profile a little bit. Um, and then the next four is a five through eight. That's a play on um, the humidity while drying. Um, so if we have any more questions, or if we want to go into cup, yeah. Yeah, do you, do you work with uh, water activity? Do you no, do I, water, I, one water activity um, value better than another one in terms of taste or, and or shelf life? Uh, I have not done much tests on water activity, just sensory. All right, should we jump into, uh, yeah? Uh, there's one question here in the back from this Danish gentleman. Morten can go first. Okay, uh, I just wanted to ask if you've been experimenting with different, uh, you know, where to introduce, uh, you know, different bacteria. It could be done, I guess, uh, different places. It could be sprayed on the trees or it could be, you know, there must be a lot of different possibil uh, possible, uh, you know, places where you could do it. And some are probably better than others and have different consequences. Do, what's your consideration here? Um. Yeast is not that cheap, so it's better to have it concentrated somewhere. Uh, we tried, you know, while, when you wash the coffee, uh, it comes through the washer, and um, we catch them in these uh, carts, and we tried just pumping them, spraying them, but uh, we didn't get much of a result. So I prefer having them in tanks, or in, even in like a grain pro bag, and just throwing it in the grain pro bag, having it in a controlled contained um, system and throwing enough yeast so that the yeast that you are using is going to be dominant over what comes on the cherry. I think maybe in a perfect world you would neutralize whatever came from the field, like an ozone water kind of thing, yeah, and then you would start fresh. But um, yeah, it's 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 kind of hard to actually just spray it. You, you need it. You need it, and and a lot of times you need a solvent as well to have it. Uh, did you try some fermentation, what you usually do in, in Sumatra? But they picking up the coffee, they take out the muscle and, and they put in the in the bags, like no, not uh, cotton bags, for 24 hours, for 20, and and then uh, going to uh, to drying. So it's also taking fermentation, but by itself, just in a small bags, like five kilo. So they put the, they pick the cherries. Yes, they took the from the depulper and put in the in the bags 
for 24 hours. Oh, wow. Um, with water or without water? Without water. Yeah. So, but it's essentially like uh, dry fermentation. But wet hold. Okay. I've never, never seen that done before. It's interesting. How, how about the water you use for the fermentation? Do you control the pH level for your test? Um, the water that we've used is from our spring. So we have uh, clean water, same as our cupping water. Um, but uh, it's probably a good idea. I haven't, have not tested the, the pH yet. Just a quick one. Uh, what does fermentation do on that slide? You know, you could also have uh, possible uh, fewer defects because you said yourself when a microorganism becomes dominant, it keeps somebody, uh, all the others away. So you could actually get fewer defects, which could be, you know, just counted. So that's an other, uh, another important point to, to add to that list of, um, you know, positive consequences of, of this. Yeah, absolutely. The consistency of the lot. So, um, you know, a lot of times, especially in, in my area, you'll get really interesting naturals, but each cup is this different. Or like you have a beautiful coffee and then you have to disqualify it. So, no, for sure. If you can, you can make sure that, like, that it all goes through the same, the same fermentation. That's would save a lot of money. Yeah, um, I'm wondering. Because you're comparing coffee, or your 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 question or your thesis in your presentation is whether coffee should be treated like wine. Um, there's a movement um, of natural wine where they are not adding any from or uh, any non-native yeasts to not um, steer the fermentation in any certain certain direction. But I think what you're proposing is to actually do that to create a more solid product, much like conventional wine is doing, right? So um, what are your thoughts on, I think, for me, especially coffee has a lot in common with natural wine because what we want is to have the actual terroir come through in the final product. And once we start manipulating where that grape or cherry comes from, we're actually not always letting that grape or cherry speak for itself and like speak for the terror that it's grown in. So um, how do you see that f like fit in within sort of the, um, you know, that, that sort of idea of specialty coffee and its relation to its terror? Cool, that's a good question. Um, I think it's up for debate. Um, my, main, my main point is, um, Instead of saying, telling farmers like fermentation is something to be avoided, um, it's something we should look at and try and understand. So uh, I'm not necessarily saying, I'm not sold yet whether yeast is good or bad, and I'm not saying necessarily that fermentation has to be with added yeast, it could be wild, spontaneous fermentation as well. Um, like when I moved to my region, here's an example. Um, it was very, it's very, some people still say this, but it was very common to hear like, oh, uh, we do uh, pasa, which means raisin. Oh, it's uh, dried on the tree. Well, I don't like those coffees very much. Um, they're always like less interesting, less intense, kind of nutty, uh, kind of dry. And essentially what happens is because it's so dry, the, dry the, the picking season, they just let the coffee go all the way dark and then they pick it and dry it. So by the time it gets to the patio, it's just going straight into drying. Um, I have always gotten better results from picking cherries um, and because I think that there is fermentation going on. Um, and I'd get, uh, for me, I get like a clear, I can pick out varietals better when I dry like that, then when I dry pasas, I can pick out the flavors a little bit better. So um, I, I think that there's a lot of ways to look at this. Um, and if you can control the, the fermentation so that you get less problems or so you get a more vibrant cup. Um, and then I saw with yeast, you add like flavors that weren't there. So I don't know whether that's good or bad. Um, and maybe that might even be better for like big farms, like 
like boring coffees that you add, you add a flavor because there's no flavor there. Whereas like some beautiful coffees, maybe you want to have the actual taste of the coffee. Um, but if you've ever cupped commodity coffee, it's pretty brutal. Um, so just having, you know, like a consistent, you know, pineapple flavor is better than just like a just very rough cup. Um, so I don't know whether the, again, like this needs to be studied like by more people, by in a more scientific way, um, and with better equipment. Um, but uh, I don't know whether the specialty coffees, whether the community will embrace this, or and how we compare this to, to like natural wines versus regular wines. Um, I don't know. I still don't know whether I like natural wines or not, to be honest. Like, uh, I went to a bar in Barcelona with like a big book of natural wines and we didn't know so we just went picking and we had three terrible wines before we had one good one and spent a lot of money on that and I bought a natural wine in, in France and flew it back to Brazil and it tasted awful so um, I don't know honestly that's another whole another kind of conversation but um, the basic point here is just uh, show you guys um, coffees with some controlled variables and then see what you guys think with the like the outcome and whether this is something that should be studied more or not um, because there's still a lot a lot needs to be studied yeah I just have a quick question regarding to what Morton was uh, asking about uh, like regarding defects you said that the um, coffees would uh, become more dense when you did this kind of tank fermentation um, when you mill the coffees did you see I mean because you would do like one the ones with density they would sort out like the lighter more awful beans would you say that you have less of those have you done any numbers of that like do you actually have less defects or less bad beans because the other good stuff became more dense do you see what i mean did the variables get bigger uh i didn't make that no. analysis yet i would say probably no mm -hmm. probably the same yeah um what we do is we separate floaters yeah from uh and and one thing that i messed up on my on my um, experiment was when you ferment, you get a lot more floaters coming up. And I didn't take them out right away. And then, and then at the end, they had sunk down. So those are less, less ripe beans, less dense beans. Um, that uh, when you do a fermentation, you get more floaters than when you just wash. So maybe you get a cleaner cup from that. Yeah. Uh, question in the back. Yeah. I know in the wine industry, um, when you ferment, the temperature during fermentation is crucial to the end product, the quality of. Do you control the temperature? And if you do, um, how do you, what do you look for, a high temperature or a low temperature? That's a good question. Um, that's a little bit on the table. Um, different temperatures. Um, I don't have like a lot of uh, data yet. I don't have enough to make a result, but um, at 40 degrees C, this, this is a study done in Brazilian universities. At 40 degrees C, the uh, embryo dies. So the coffee dies. Um, and then the cell wall starts breaking and the, the all that's in the cell the amino acids, proteins, all that stuff, it, it gets spread out. So they can they can do like a cut in the in the bean and look under a microscope and you can see all that. So what happens with coffees dried above 40 degrees C is um, the oxidation process happens faster. So the, everything that gives taste is, is still alive, it's spread out. So like, um, you know, after 30 days from drying, the, the, the tannins will go away much faster. The coffee might taste great when you're at origin cupping it. And then three, four months later, just dies really fast. Um, so if you dry a coffee slower, and then if you dry a coffee at lower temperature, say around like 35 degrees C, you preserve that cell structure for much longer. Um, while you're fermenting, and there's a, there's a coffee on the table 
dried at uh, 34 degrees. There's a coffee dried at 32 degrees. There's one at 28 and one at 25. Um, there's a slight variance in humidity in them as well. Um, but I, it's my guess to say that that affects the flavor on the type of, the type of flavor profile. And then we did some drying. We did a whole bunch of experiments that did not really work out. They, I mean, they worked, but they're very, very small, minute changes that I decided not to put them on the table because it was too cold. So we dried, we fermented at around 12 degrees C. They were really cold nights, and um, there was very little agitation happening. If you saw in the video, even though it was without uh, volume, you could see it was like alive. Um, at 12 to 15 degrees C, there's not much agitation going on. So there's very little change in, in flavor. It's just kind of a little bit cleaner cup. Um, I would guess that like ideal fermentation is anywhere between 18 to 25 degrees. So this is a bit of a strange one, but can you explain what you mean by you can't make coffee on the plane? Because I flew from Australia and did that about six times on the way here. <laughs> it's a long flight. Um, I mean, did you bring your AeroPress? Okay. I mean, you can't get good coffee like served by the stewardess and stuff like that. It's like um, basically like commodity wine tastes not bad, and commodity coffee tastes awful. So I don't know if fermentation can help commodity because like you get, you're not going to tell a commodity farmer to pick differently, to dry differently. They just they aren't going to do it. They're not going to do it. But if they can in 18 hours like change their flavor, you know, from a 78 to an 84 like then that could they would do it, you know, but they're not, they, they're not going to do what we're telling them to do. They're not going to do raised beds. They're not going to pick ripe. They're not going to do any of that stuff. Uh, at this point of experiment, is it po already possible to tell what uh, the flavors or qualities of coffee that fermentation will emphasize even before the fermentation takes place? Uh, well, I think maybe we should cup. Um, but uh, it's still like I'm still kind of guessing. You know, I'm not like a haven't done this like very scientifically, but um, a few things that I've picked out, um, the fermentation gives a cleaner, crisper cup. So in my area, I get a lot of like dry, nutty notes that I can get away, I can kind of get out of the cup. Um, if I do an acetic fermentation, I increase this, the, like the citric, even sour notes, uh, and I get a lower body. You get like a, even an effervescence about the coffee. If you do a anaerobic with uh, out oxygen or with water, you increase the, the texture, the body of the coffee. Um, and if you add some kind of sugar, you really get a lot of creamy texture to the, to the coffee. Um, and yeah, the rest, I think we should. Yeah, I think, I think uh, uh, if there are any more questions, we will definitely have time for that afterwards. But aren't you excited of uh, just going there and taste it? OK, let's do it. So one through four is the same exact coffee, same exact trees picked on the same exact day. Did you guys taste any difference between numbers one through four? Cool. So that the only the varietal is the same, the plants are the same, the management's the same, the part two, part three of drying was the same. So the only thing changed was number one. Now, I'm not saying that I I got it right. I, I think I messed up a lot, but I just wanted to show you guys like that how much change can happen uh, in each of these steps if, if you if you start to go into it. So number one is a regular natural. That's basically like uh, pick the coffee, put it on a, on a raised bed, and dried it. Um, this was a fairly um, dry part of the year, so this was done in August, early August. In early August, my humidity is around 40%. 
gets it getting below 40%. Um, so for me, I feel like it's a little too dry. I don't get enough interesting fruits out of it that I would like, personally, my personal, okay. Um, number two is uh, I put it, I took the skin off and I put it in a tank uh, with water and I wanted to ferment it longer. Um, the reason why I wanted to ferment it longer was uh, I wanted to influence the body. Um, so the put sugarcane juice uh, that we have on the farm, we just ground it and threw it in. So that's 72 hours, uh, open tank. Um, and so f I don't know what you guys think. For me, I saw some changes. The coffees are very fresh. Uh, there's some, some green so sour notes, but the body I thought was, was changed quite a bit. Number three uh, took the, it's what I showed you guys in the video is three and four. So number three um, took the skin off, put it in a tank, threw water and um, sugar and uh, the champagne yeast. This is a very fruity champagne yeast. Um, then number four left the, bean, left the whole cherry intact, put it into a tank with water and it put sugar and yeast. And um, originally I was gonna do this at a brewery, in a stainless steel tank, but they got busy and so I, I improvised and I wanted to do it at a slightly higher temperature because the tests we had done in July was really cold. Uh, but I think the fermentation was so alive that it jumped the temperature pretty high. So it got up to 34 degrees on number three and 32 degrees on number uh, four. What, what did you guys think of the first four? Anybody want to? Um, who liked number one the best? Wow. <laughs> who liked number two the best? Vegetal sour. Interesting. Uh, who liked number three the best? Okay. And number four? Wow. Cool. Anybody want to, do you guys want to say something about four? Yeah? Um, wait, wait, wait. wait. <laughs> no, but I should say number three and number four I liked a lot. Uh, number four I probably loved. Uh, though, like it had this like very buttery, like melted butter touch to it, like typical talking about wine. Uh, high acidity, tropical fruits, like very complex. So, yeah, one of the best cups I've tasted from Brazil in a while. Wow. Um, what about number f uh, one? Would you say that about number one? Yeah, it was good, but it was a little metallic, like for some reason, and a little thinner body. Yeah. Um, number three tasted a lot like, like it was also good. It was very uh, herbal, a little thinner, uh, maybe. And uh, number three I'm talking about now, but I also have the wine reference to like greener, whereas Isa, like I'm looking at a wine person, greener visor, uh, that, that kind of grape, like very herbal and also buttery uh, in a good way, so. Cool, thank you. That's crazy, the, the same exact coffee, same exact coffee. Um, the one mistake I think I made in number three and number four is I didn't take the floaters off, and then the day I went to take the coffees out, they had all fallen to the bottom. Um, so I think it would have made a cleaner cup if I would have taken that out. To me, uh, number four was too whiny. That I would consider kind of a defect. I used to love it many years ago, but then somebody told me it was wrong to love a coffee like that. <laughs> so s since then I hated it. I think that's why we cup in silence. Um, yeah, I guess for me personally, I'm not sure if I if I am in love with those coffees or not. I think they're really cool. Um, I think that uh, so now maybe transitioning to the next next round. Or I, I will. Exp I just have a quick uh, question. Number three and four was it the same yeast that you used? Same yeast. Okay. So um, there's a couple of things there. I think there's the yeast, and then there's the temperature. 
that uh, it was fermented on and maybe the amount of fermentation activity. So uh, perhaps I would try the next time at a lower temperature. Um, I think it got a little bit high, which uh, I've seen influences the, f the fruit flavors a little bit. Um, and then maybe there are some yeasts that are, you, that's what I said about mapping out the yeast flavors, because there are some yeasts that are less fruity. So this is like a pungent fruity. This was like, a, I really wanted to make a point um, with this with these yeast. And also they're really fresh. So like, I think it's gonna tone down in about a month or two. George here from Greece. Yeah. <laughs> do you, do you make the same ratio between water and the uh, quantity of coffee yeah. every time? More or less. Because I just use water as a solvent, so I just cover the coffee a little bit, basically. But you, you don't measure the water in the coffee? No. Because I if you put uh, you, uh, something inside, to be precise, you have to know specific amounts of uh, everything. I need some helpers on the farm. <laughs> So um, we basically, like I've used it, the concept of water as a solvent. So I just cover the, the cherries to kind of spread it, uh, make sure that it goes around all the beans. But uh, in the buckets, I used to do like precise ratios. But in the tanks, um, I, did, I found it did not translate like, like the, the way I thought. So no, I would need some, somebody was telling me, Morton, I think about sending a scientist, somebody to help me. That'd be cool. Oh. There's, so, uh, there's one question here from Chris. Yep. Is it skin off for both three and four? Skin off, three, skin on, four. So sk uh, number four is whole cherry. It's an, I don't know what to call it. It's a washed natural. <laughs> it's a, uh, so like the, the, um, the video roasting, I don't know if you guys were able to notice, but that was when number one and number four roasting at the same time. I put them in the same temperature uh, and then they, they were like, they roasted totally different. Number four was much more dense. And so if you were to roast number four, it's, it's totally different than roasting number one. Um, and I think, I don't know what it is that is eaten, aw that is fermented away, uh, if it's like a sugar or something, um, but you can, you can roast it at a higher temperature than, than the regular natural. Right. So uh, I'm sorry we are kind of out of time, Felipe, but uh, thank you very much for this. Um, don't clap, right, right, right. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Felipe. Thank you. Thank you.